Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're joined by Matt Heiner. Uh, you may know him from Instagram as at the underscore Yardist, the Yardist on Instagram, and his company is Heiner Outdoor Living. And today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff around his business. He's been in the industry for over 20 years on his own, running his company for over 10. And we're going to dive into some very juicy details about all that stuff today. Matt, how are you? I'm great, Alex. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on the show. So, Matt, we um, this is going to be interesting because in full transparency, this is the first conversation that you and I have ever had. We've exchanged a lot of DMs on Instagram the past few weeks, but that's pretty much it. I, it is, yeah. You know, Teco is just now breaking into the Colorado market as of a couple of years. So, you know, it's something that I've been campaigning for to get you guys here. And, and I'm excited to start building this relationship with you guys. Well, thank you very much. We're excited to be there, too. Uh, you know, in my career at Tackle Block, I've uh, I've been here for well, this is my 16th year now, but I was involved in opening up the markets across Canada, going all the way west out to to Vancouver. And uh, every time I'd meet someone, they're always like, "Man, thank God you you guys are finally here! I can't <laughs> wait to start playing with your stuff." So I totally yeah. know that feeling. We have some cool, fun, exciting products, but uh, it's always fun when people are excited f to see us finally arrive. It makes <laughs> makes the job Absolutely. that much easier. Yeah. But uh, I find it interesting how we basically ended up meeting through Instagram. Um, and that's how a lot of people end up discovering our products. And, and a lot of people discover you and your company. Uh, you have like, I think it's 30,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, it's like almost 62. Oh, really? Yeah. 62. So like what, uh, was that Something an intentional like that. thing for you? Or how um, did that happen? I mean, it's been something I've been grinding for a while, but I, I started just two, three years ago. Uh, I went and flew out to L.A. and built a pond for Logan Paul. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, he was just this social media, like, like giant, and it just kind of pushed me into doing something, and I, I didn't really know what I was doing when I started it. It was just a way to have an outlet for being that landscape geek that I am and it just yeah. kind of took off. And so I've just been having fun with it and, and, and working it. So, yeah. So has that been an important part of your business with Heiner Outdoor? Cause I know you kind of have them as separate accounts, right? Yeah. I mean, the artist has definitely evolved into more of like a personal brand, mm -hmm. which feeds uh, Heiner Outdoor Living. And if you had asked me two years ago that my number one lead source outside of word, uh, you know, client referrals, would have been Instagram, I would have laughed at your face. So <laughs> It's incredible, man. Like we've had a few guys on now and uh, it just blows my mind how you can single-handedly drive all the lead demand for your business through one platform. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I, you hear all these social media moguls telling you like, you know, you got to be on, you know, on, on, Instagram, Facebook, you got to have a YouTube channel. And, you know, every time there's a new platform, you got to be on it and it just gets overwhelming. And mm -hmm. I just found my success just going all in on Instagram and it's just paying off huge. So is that something that um, when you look at, at your overall strategy for growing your business, is it something that you, you throw a lot of effort, a lot of energy at, or is it something that you're just passionate about it. You're just doing your thing with the artist and it's, it's boosting everything else as you go. It started out like that, just something that I was passionate about and just kind of playing around. And now that I'm starting to see the fruits and it's kind of woken me up to seeing the capabilities that Instagram has. And now I'm being very intentional about my efforts and putting a lot more effort into it. Okay. So that intentionality, I assume, means that you have some goals for your business in terms of like where you are now, what you're trying to do. Would you mind sharing some of those goals with us? Sure. Yeah. So um, I would say we were just struggling to get past that million dollar mark. We were hovering between one million and one point uh, three million for about four or five years. How long and, ago was that? Uh, that was just two years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, just two years ago, we were. I, I just hit this wall and this plateau, and I just it kind of put me into a funk because when I first started my business uh, in '08, uh, I grew really quickly to a million, um, but then I plateaued, and I didn't know how to get past that. 
and I feel like Instagram was really just that kind of, uh, it was that golden ticket that really helped me break free and just kind of have, start having fun at what I was doing again. And, you know, we went from, uh, you know, I, I cleaned house uh, in the business and got rid of a lot of senior leadership, cut back to my core. And then we did, you know, I went from like 17 employees down to like nine. And in that year, we did the same amount of business with half the amount of the uh, team. And so um, the following year, we just grew on that. And then we got to like 1. You know, 1.3. And then last year, we just broke uh, 2 million. And so this year, uh, you know, we now have our crosshairs on 3 million. That's a significant increase. You want a 50% increase year over year. I did. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and more importantly than the top end is we, you know, we're looking at our gross profits and more importantly than that is the net profits. Like I'm not after that fancy big number. It's more important to serve the client and uh, protect the bottom line first and foremost. You know. So when when talking about well, actually, there, you just gave me an hour's worth of questions just with that quick <laughs> that quick yeah. story, but uh, okay. So let let's just go to the point where you started in '08. It was easy to get to a million dollars, and then you just were kind of stuck. Yeah. What what did you do to get to that first million? What were some of the things that that made that happen? in terms of marketing, in terms of design, in terms of construct, whatever comes to mind, how you got sure. that far. I would say, you know, I've been the primary salesperson, especially to get to that $1 million mark. Um, what worked best for me was I'm naturally creative. I can be the best designer if I wanted to, but I'm also all over the place. And I've got bigger goals than just trying to be a really good designer. And so, uh, one of the things that I found a lot of success in growing the company to that was just putting a, a quick quote unquote napkin sketch together and then handing that off to a third party design team like remotely and just using and leaning on them to put together that polished, really nice looking presentation that I could then put my estimate to and then I could uh, get together with the homeowners and clients and then sell them on that, that outdoor space. That got rid of all that, you know, the late nights and putting that time in and allowed me to just focus on building it right, building the relationships and selling the next job. So you got your vision on paper for the client, which is what people are drawn to about your business anyway, from the, the aesthetic part that they can see. Yep. Right. The, the big switch for you to take that next level was instead of me doing the concept all the way to the finish line with the final you know, CAD drawings or full material takeoffs, all that. I may get the vision on paper, sell them on the vision because that's the part that I'm best at. This yep. other part that's more time consuming that other people could do with the right guidance, I'm going to sub that out. Exactly. And now, did, do you, you, know, did you we, sub it or did you hire someone full time to do it at first? I subbed it because okay. uh, I subbed it because at that size of company, you can't necessarily afford to bring somebody on full time. That's and what I'm so, asking the question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, so subbing that out allowed me to get to that next level without having the full time burden of hiring some uh, hiring for a position that I wasn't even qualified to do myself. So that really allowed me to focus on what I knew best, which was you know doing the install work and running the crews and just growing the business. Okay. And then that allowed me to to lean on some of the the outside professionals on a sub uh, on a subcontractor basis. I love it. What's the situation look like today now that you're a two million with your eyes on three? Still the same model? Uh, a little bit. You know, I do now have a full uh, full time design and salesperson. Okay. And she's great. She she does a lot of her own stuff. But even then, we're still subbing out all the 3D. You know, I've had a 3D person in house. It seems like that position comes and goes. And I, you know, I don't mind having that in house again. But you know, there's something nice about just being able to lean on that subcontractor because that's all they do. They're a little bit more efficient. They might have a little bit more detail, better plant library, all, you know, all the things that, that make that special. And, you know, and I, I now have kind of a tool belt of a few, few of them that I like to work with on a regular basis because one might be busy or backlogged or not available. And, um, you know, so that just allows me to turn it around professionally for my clients. So when I sell a design, I can then, um, you know, turn that around and, and schedule a follow up, you know, in a, in a, in a professional manner. That's awesome, man. Okay. So, uh, next question I have based on your story, uh, I'm just picking out like milestones from what you were saying. Yeah. 
you went from like at one point you're like, okay, this is enough. I'm cleaning house. You went from 17 employees to nine employees, uh, but same revenue. What yeah. led up to that? Because I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it the way I see it. 17 employees at one to 1.5 million, the revenue per employee is way too low. Way so too low. how did you end up getting that many employees without the revenue f- coming along at the same level? What happened? I just wasn't making my sales goals. And I had an operations manager in the role that just wasn't bringing the gross profits either. You know, we were losing money uh, year after year. And I was in, you know, I thought I was investing in my team and I was just, I was just going to the uh, school of hard knocks at that point and just really learning. You know, I was, I was watching the numbers, but I was also, you know, I, I had a lot of growing in myself of self-awareness and leadership to just realize that I had the wrong guy lead in the field from an operation standpoint. And, you know, had, had I been a smart enough man to listen to my wife, you know, two months after I hired him and not held on to him for three or four years, probably would have saved myself a lot of heartache, but uh, I wouldn't have learned the lesson that I needed to, which was just to like hire slow and fire fast, you know? Yeah, I can, Um, I can totally relate to everything you just said so, there, so, <laughs> including yeah. the listening to your wife. Oh, man. So long story short, I uh, I got rid of him, got rid of all the B and C players, just hung on to my top guys that I kind of almost started the business with, just went back to the basics and, you know, put more responsibility on my individual foreman and said, look, I'm not replacing this position at this time. I'm putting it on you guys. I gave each of them a little bit of a raise just to – uh, you know, compensate for the added uh, responsibility and double down on the team. It's amazing what your team will do when you put a challenge in front of them and you and then and then you motivate them to stand up and and um, uh, to step up and and rise to the occasion. And they did. Let's talk about that a little bit. When you say it's amazing what they'll do, you have to frame the challenge a certain way because otherwise yep. it looks like well we just let go of a bunch of people but all this work is still here so I'm expecting double out of you it's not necessarily well perceived all the time so how like there's one thing about the attitude of the A player on your team that's willing to go through a wall to to make things happen for you but there's a limit to that too so what did those conversations actually look like well I first I think it was a relief when when I broke the news I think there was some shock and then a relief because I got really I, I, I cut the cancer out right at the top and okay. um, and so they, okay, they so got th- it. this this person was was a problem on multiple levels. It, it was, yeah, and, okay. and it was staring at it, you know it was just uh, typical boss versus a versus a leader, you know. Just uh, I come to find you know hindsight's twenty twenty, and come to find out, uh, he, you know, his nickname from the crew guys was Captain Hindsight. He was always great about showing up at the jobs and just. You know, telling them all the things that they did wrong, yeah. as opposed to just setting them up for success. And the then Monday morning quarterback like, kind of thing. Yeah, and it yeah. was just it was just a terrible, um, a terrible situation. And so, you know, I pulled my office manager aside at the time, and we just got organized and you know leaned on our our uh, Dynascape managed software and printed up the timesheets. And you know, once we put all that together, we just realized the mess that we were inheriting and how he was just flying by the seat of our, his pants. And so uh, I didn't know how bad it was until I, you know, I had to jump in firsthand and, you know, but that, I think that's as a business owner, that's what you got to do. You got to roll up your sleeves and you got to take a couple steps backwards before you can go forward. And so when I did, to answer your question, when I did actually pull those guys aside and, and we had a sit down meeting and I, I broke the news that he was no longer with us to sit up, but you know, we're going to get through this and, and we're going to, you know, you know, you're now looking at me in charge. And then I pulled each one aside individually and said, this is what, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it moving forward. Because what we were doing was putting us out of business. We are all going to be looking for a job if we don't make some, some drastic changes. So it was, it was move that, that person out. And then the people who are still left, bring them together, rally them together, say, look, this is the team moving forward you're still here because we believe in you and this is the direction that we want to go and each of you matter and yep. really breaking down like the role that they play that's where you were having those one-on-ones with them right exactly yeah and and 
you know, and it's a it's about painting that vision for them and saying this is where we're going to go. Are you with me or are you not? Because if not, mm-hmm. we can stop right here and 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 we can shake hands and part ways. That's so important. And you know, I'm working in a in a larger business, but it's the exact same thing within our teams, within our departments, and within the company. We need to paint the bigger picture. And then you need to break it down into what the big picture looks like for each individual team and then each individual person. Like, what role do you play in this whole thing so yeah. that everyone understands where we're going, why we're going there, how we're going to get there, and why you're so important and, and we need to be able to depend on you to deliver this. Exactly. And then furthermore, you got to tell them what winning looks like. you got to be able to set them up and show them what that success looks like from a, you know, from a, keep KPI, like key performance indicator. So, that's right. you know, for us, that's man hours and gross profit, you know, for the crew guys, you know, so can I've you got, give a couple of examples like hardscape specific? Cause I know you do a bunch of other things, but I'm just trying to relate to our, our, our audience here. Absolutely. A couple examples of KPIs that you have for uh, your business. Yeah. So let's say we're building a patio and we've gotten allotted like 400 man hours for the job. You know, we're going to have a breakdown of all of the, uh, all the materials and all that kind of stuff, but your biggest risk when you're running these jobs is going to be on the time spent getting it done. You know, so if if we can, you know, align ourselves and look at that as our biggest variable and our biggest risk, and put everybody's attention towards managing that risk the most, then everything else will start to take care of itself. So we've got a bonus structure set up now. Uh, for the crew guys to get paid out quarterly and the foreman to be paid out quarterly, all based on performance of of those man hours. And so we'll put a running total for everything to go. So that way, if we have like a, a job that goes south, you know, they're not going to get punished for just that, that job. We're yeah. going to take the average amongst everything that we're doing. So that way we can tie into our core value of playing the long game and, and put that into effect uh, through our bonus program. So um, I'm just I'm going to come back to, to, to the, the KPIs on that patio. Let's say it's a patio with the 400 man hours. Is it do you have um, you have it by job function, let's say, is if you're keeping an yeah. eye on time, that's the biggest variable. It's also the yep. greatest cost. Therefore, it's the greatest risk. I, I like the way that you put it. But exactly. if you have it broke it down like uh, excavation. Uh, installation of base, screening of bedding layer, laying of pavers, cutting of pavers, and, and you have like how many man hours per unit kind of thing? We will. He, yeah, but I, 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 try and, I try to find the fine line of getting too detailed because I want my guys focused on the job and not breaking down each individual. So I'll, I'll have like okay. hardscape ac- excavation, I'll have a hardscape installation, and then hardscape cutting. Um, and then demo and, and hardscape, like, uh, like it's kind of big buckets of, kind of tasks, stuff. big buckets, you know, so that okay. way you can separate the forest from the trees and they don't get bogged down with too many details because you want them focused on the bigger picture as well. And so, you know, one area that we lack on is giving them enough time for demo just to be able to clear the old out and then, you know, bring the new in. So. And you, and I, I'm going to assume you, when you're able to confidently say that, like you just did, like one area that we know we have to get better at is allocating enough time for demo. That's because you you have the estimate broken down with the time. Then exactly. you're looking at the real broken down at the time. And yep. you're seeing where the gap is because you have those big buckets. And exactly. this big bucket is consistently off. So we need to adjust. It's not yep. on them. It's on us in the office or the salesperson or whatever, right? Exactly. You know, it's it's important. Like once you do your estimates like this, you have to job cost at the end and then you have to job cost. But then you have to look at it on a regular basis because you have to course correct these things Mm -hmm. when it's fresh. And so every Tuesday we have our team meeting and then once a month we make sure we bring in all the foremen so we can really break things down. But all of our salespeople and designers are also in charge of kind of quasi project managing. So there's a so they got a tight pulse on what's going on on the job on a regular basis because they also do their estimating as well. Um, but that allows them to manage that relationship with the client all the way through through the duration of the project. Um, but we're able to look at those things and forecast whether we're going over or under. And, you know, green means we're good, red means we're bad. And if we have to, like, you know, dive into it more, we've got that information handy to us. So that way you can, you can, 
you know, you can keep a higher level of looking at those numbers, but then when it's not, that information is available so you can dive in deeper yeah. and, and look at it. I was just smiling when you said green is good, red is bad, because <laughs> we, we, we implemented that here with a few of our KPIs, and, yeah. uh, and that was the president's idea, and he just he could not stop talking about it because it became so clear for everybody. Yeah. This is with our plants. We have eight manufacturing facilities, and all of a sudden, everybody on the shop floor knows are we on track or not yeah and it if has green, such a good. huge go <laughs> yeah that's it we're good we're good it's we're right good. okay we got to regroup oh, something's wrong but yep. it makes a big difference because everyone starts to think about the things that matter most to you as the business owner so yep. you start aligning your team with something just so simple as green or red yep i love it amazing yeah uh when you have um these team meetings every tuesday what's a team meeting look like uh, team meeting is, you know, mainly my leadership team along with my sales team. And so we'll go over uh, job costing first and foremost. We'll look at job opportunities and we'll also look at the schedule, work orders. And then I might, you know, I try and throw in some, you know, some 10, 15 minute trainings uh, on something that might have popped up throughout the week. Uh, okay. Something that I feel like we need to, to pay attention to. Um, so it's like a it, revenue status, right? The pipeline yep. of jobs coming in and sold. Then you yep. got a operation status in terms of like where we stand with the project calendar and how things are moving along. And then there's a training component to continuously raise the bar for your team. Exactly. And then we'll throw in some housekeeping stuff, you know, and just kind of making Maybe, sure everything's yeah. going. But that's a higher Dot level. Dot the stuff. I's, cross the T's. Exactly. Cool. You said uh, you also alluded at one point to one of your core values. What are the core values of Heiner Outdoor Living? We've got 12 of them. Um, oh, so, okay. Yeah. It, it's, Let's buckle yeah, up it, here. <laughs> it's buckle up. So, I, I, yeah, and, and I try to make it short and simple. So each one is intuitive. So it, it ranges from build positive win-win relationships to playing the long game, be proactive, respect yourself and others, uh, take ownership better than yesterday, uh, I could go through all these if you'd like. Yeah, but, let's keep uh, going. Let's keep yeah, going. So, it's, it's all good uh, stuff. Good isn't enough. Excellence is essential. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been on the job and you're like, oh, that's good enough. That's a, you know, no, no, that, no. That's, a, that's a red flag to just go, oh, pause. Well, now nah, we need to make this better, you know. Yeah. So it's just a uh, lead by example. Do the right thing. Have passion and pride in your work. Stay humble. Uh, but most importantly, have fun. That's amazing. I guarantee that's going to get a lot of playbacks. <laughs> if you're going to rewind, <laughs> listen to yeah. again, write it down. Uh, but yeah, that's that's. When did you uh, when did you decide that that was important? Which one? The values. Just the establishing values. values. It's been something I've kind of been working on, but I I really got it dialed in last year, and then and and I've just been using my core values to be the compass of everything that we do at this company now from training to, you know, discipline to hiring to making decisions. Mm. You know, when, when an employee will come to me and they'll ask me a question, I'll just say, you know, well, what are your options? And then they'll name off X, Y, Z. And I'll say, all right, which one do you think aligns with the core values the most? That one. All right, do that. So I'm not only teaching them how to answer their own questions, but I'm, I'm leading them through the core values and I'm giving them an identity of something that's going to, you know, respect themselves and push them to the greater limits and just really just build that, that positivity. And the energy in the office has just gone through the roof. It's, sure. it's such a, an infectious place to be in, in such a good way. Like it's, we're having so much fun here and it's, and it's starting to grow quickly as as we talked about earlier. So, so that 50% um, growth, growth in revenue is, is not looking so daunting when everyone is just drinking the Kool-Aid and saying, yeah, we can totally yeah, do this. Exactly. We're cranking. So yeah. And we're just having fun and clients are being served well. And, and that, and I, I'll hit pause at any time if, if I feel like quality is slipping and our experience is slipping. Cause that's, that's Trump and everything else. So mm. what, uh, what kind of leadership uh, training do you have? Because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, if you're stumbling across this stuff, you're like some kind of natural genius. 
<laughs> and if not, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely putting a focus on leadership and leadership within the business. And that seems to be the, the thing that's really driving all this positive change for you. So I, I've been a self-development junkie for the last 10, better part of 12, 14 years, just okay. reading books. Uh, I started reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I, yep. first and foremost, I did not, I barely finished high school. I didn't go to college. Um, I was you on a job site. You wouldn't know it from the stuff you're saying, man. I, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I had a job back when I was in my early 20s uh, while I was dating my wife, and I was uh, basically in a field watching, you know, watching stakes to make sure that they weren't being run over by kids. And so I had a lot of free time. I was being paid about 10 bucks an hour to sit in a truck and be a glorified security guard. Okay. Uh, and, and so rather than just sitting there, uh, I read books and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the first book I ever picked up and read cover to cover. And that just kind of ignited a fire. It taught me about a, the basics. And I just went down uh, a rabbit hole of reading this, that, and the other. Fast forward to today, I, I now seek out mentors and, and mentorship. I listen to podcasts all the time to fill my brain with good, positive stuff. Um, I'm part of uh, like a, an elite business group called the Arte Syndicate, which is led by Ed Milet and Andy Frisella, who both have podcasts. And, and man, they just, those guys run multi, multi level uh, million dollar companies. And they just bring it every single week to the pod, uh, to our, our, our Zoom meetings. And so they, you know, I, I think I dialed in a lot of my core values and how to use it from, from, from those calls themselves. It's um, incredible to me how many resources there are available if you just open your eyes and your ears a little bit. Yeah, you know, so many, so many people in the industry is they, they not underestimate. The that's it, and they underestimate the power that they have to grow as individuals and, and grow as leaders within their companies because mm -hmm. they say like, you know, I wasn't really ever good in school, and you know that that's why I do this and. Like that doesn't matter at all. Do you know how to read? All the information. Yeah. Do you know how to all, listen? It, yeah. Like it's, it's all there. Then, then you're it's good. It's all free. Yeah. It's all free. The the hard part is taking action on it and mm. and taking responsibility for yourself and realizing that you have these resources and then acting upon it and then you know taking what you learn and then putting that to work. So it's it's really that simple. Can we talk about that that mind shift then? Because just, you know, you said you, you picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you read that book. That doesn't magically turn you around, right? Like, the, there must have been no, a struggle no, to I, start implementing things and changing the way you approach your business, the way you approach oh, yeah. your life. Do you mind if we, we kind of dive into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you got to be stubborn to a point because you, your life is still going to kick you down and you're still going to want to default to your original uh, – your original self, your original beliefs, you will literally be reprogramming your mind of how you were raised to be. So if you were raised in a home of scarcity mindset and raised in a home where, you know, things are just too expensive, that's going to trickle into your sales pitch when you're trying to sell a techo high end product. You know, you're going to be looking at that and you're going to be like, oh, that's 45 bucks a square foot installed. Like, they can't afford that. Like, no, you're selling to your own bank account. You have to sell to theirs. And you don't always know what that's going to be. So you just have to assume that they have it. And that's unknown and uncharted territory. And that's scary to step into. And so you have to, you know, you have to believe that it's there. And it, you know, for me, that, that happened over a long period of time by taking little steps. I didn't just wake up one day and, and start selling things at top dollar. No. I, I, you know, I, I started selling things at a little, bit, know, more. little, 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 bit, more. little, little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah. And like, and over a course of 12 years, I went from stuff that would be putting me out of business to actually putting stuff that allows me to have high overhead and high profit. So it allows me to just excel at having a profitable business while providing a superior experience for our clients too. And, and you, it, there's a, there's a real good, 
a uh, little nugget within there, which is as you can raise the prices, and it's again, it's not about gouging the client. It's not about ripping people off or trying to line no. your pockets. If you can raise the prices to a point where the th core values that you said matter most, you yeah. know, good isn't enough. Excellence is, is, the, is the goal. Uh, you know, we're trying to deliver value to the customer. We want to wow them. We want to have a good experience ourselves. If these are things that truly matter to the business, raising the prices of, of your projects facilitates mm -hmm. all of that. It puts you in a position where you can hire office managers so the yeah. admin side stays uh, running smoothly and you can focus on the next step for your business. It allows you to invest in better equipment to make a better, safer work environment for your team and, and enable you to have a more diverse team as well where you don't need a bunch of six foot four, 250 pound football players to, to lug rocks and wheelbarrows around. Like anybody can do the job if you have the right equipment and the right training. Yep. Uh, being able to elevate the experience for the customer where if you know, you know, these plants came in, but ultimately they're not the best plants and the customer is not going to be thrilled with this. We should swap them out. If you have that extra margin built in because you're selling at a price that delivers excellence, then you can maintain that customer experience that they expected from the beginning all the way through to delivery and then in the follow up of projects as well. So it, it's so key to shift your mindset. And I love the way that you said it, like you cannot operate a business that is growing in a mindset of scarcity. We're in a market of abundance. There are more people that you could ever do business with in your life. There are more projects than you could ever build in your life. And there's more money than any of us could ever have in our lives. So don't think oh. that you're limited. There are no limits. The only limits are the ones in your head. So get rid of those and then you fly. Preach. Yeah, you're going to get back what you put out. So if you're going to put out and you're going to default to what your original belief is. And so, you know, if, if you were raised in a home that's telling you that, I, you know, it's too expensive, you're going to have to get three bids or whatever, you're going to, that's going to pour into your business life and your sales pitch. Mm. So if you can believe and make that mind shift change and realize that there is more and put out that abundance mindset, you're going to attract that and it's naturally going to come. People want to do business with people that they know, like, and trust. And if, you know, and if you want to attract wealthy clients, you got to act like a wealthy person. I, I don't know what to add to that. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> I agree. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your team a little bit because we, we, we talked about it before, how like it blew up and you kind of re reconstructed it. What are the roles on your team today? Roles. Uh, their number one job is to keep all the distractions away from me. So I can focus on the <laughs> okay. bigger picture of things, <laughs> simply put. Um, so we just went through a, a restructuring too. So, you know, what was working at 1 million got us to 2 million. But what was working, you know, that was not going to be the roadmap to get us to three or five. And so we literally just broke it down and I restructured it to the point where, you know, I drew out the organizational chart of how everything was just a cluster and just moving around and kind of going to me where it was a fork or on the road. Does it go to Sharissa in the office or does it go to Matt to answer this question? And so I kind of put myself above and I created a new role of a general manager and then flatlined it out, created more like a, a decentralized um, accountability system with the, with the different roles and um, promoted my office manager to general manager. So now she can, uh, she really stepped up and took the reins and, and I've got people in the right places um, to, uh, you know, to, to take care of their individual roles. So. so does that mean that when that office manager went into the general manager role, you now have a new office manager? She's still doing it. So, but the thing is, is, is now we have this roadmap to where when it, something comes too much, you know, kind of like how cells split, you know, you got one cell that gets too big and then it splits into two. Yeah. And, you know, just like when you're the entrepreneur, you got all these different hats on. That's it. And so eventually you, you need to, a right hand. Eventually you need right a right hand. That right hand needs a right hand. And then that right exactly. hand needs a right hand. So I'm teaching my team to do the same thing. So I'm teaching them, the more, the busier you get, the, you know, all you're going to do is you're not working yourself out of a job. You're creating an, you're creating your own promotion and creating a new job underneath you because we're going to still need you. We're not 
you're not growing out of a job, you're growing into a job and we're growing together. And so, you know, as the leader, it's my job to paint a big enough vision and a big enough, um, you know, goals to where all of my team's goals and visions can fit inside of that. And so if I'm not growing and if I'm not, if I'm not painting a big enough, um, you know, picture for them, those eight players are out because they want to grow and they want, they want opportunity to be free and to go do those things. And so if I'm not constantly working on myself so they can go do those things, I'm going to be dead in the water. That is so key. You want to build a strong business, you need A players. And what you just said is absolutely true. A players want to achieve. They want to grow. They want the challenges that come with that. So you need to paint a picture of, uh, that's so big and so ambitious that they're like, yeah, man, I, I am on board. Let's go. Buckle up. Start the engine. I, I don't care how fast this thing moves. Like, I'm, I'm excited. Let's do yep. it. And, yep, and, and exactly. that's what you're talking about doing and painting that picture and taking the time to take the step back and see if that picture is still the picture that you want. And if you, if it is start bringing people into the room and show them that picture. Yep. It's and key, it's amazing. Eh? You paint that picture, you have your core values in line, and then, then you only need two things. You need people and leads. Is that simple? Well, the leads are coming from Instagram. <laughs> yeah, the people are coming yeah. from Instagram too. That's, you know because yeah. you know I'm trying to. It, it's so, this day and age with people being you know hard hardworking people being one of the hardest things to find. Yeah, it's just as, just as important to market your business as a fun place to work as it is to find new employees. Absolutely, dude. Or to find new clients. Excuse me. So, yeah. yeah. No. No. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I was yeah. picking up what you were laying down. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, so. What, how do you do that then? Do, is there, do you have like specific campaigns that you try to use to reach people or it's really just like, again, I'll, just share that big picture out with the world and it will attract what you want, yeah, either customers I, or employees. I, I try and, you know, I try to tie everything back to the core values or just share stories, you know, yeah. with Instagram that are just behind the scenes of us goofing off, having a good time, you know, and, and just kind of show that energy. It's infectious in a great way to where people want to be a part of that. Um, I, I do believe that there's some, some campaigns that you can put out there, but like, uh, you know, I'm working on taking my team to, uh, you know, a conference retreat in Florida, you know, my my leadership team, you know, that's going to be a perk. And when I'm out there, I plan on getting some video content to kind of, you know, have them speak of what it's what, like. So that way yeah. I can start running um, campaigns of advertising on Instagram that, you know, Heiner's the, you know, Heiner's the place to work. Yeah, man, that's very smart. What do you love the most about your job? Uh, that's, that's easy. The, the basics of just, um, you know, just seeing the clients, reaction when they've got that awesome space you know particularly when we get to build a pond for somebody because that's something so unique that most people don't really get until they have one mm. and so you know we've been really honing in on our ability to to marriage the hardscape with like the pond edge or the pool edge mm -hmm. you know so um and it, it's just been a, a way to kind of uh bring that home and 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 just following back up years after like people just you know it's like visiting family when you come back to a project from three years yeah. ago we miss you we want to we want to move to a new house so we can start the process all over again like that's my favorite part you're of doing job. something right if that's what they're saying so, yeah so uh with the structure of your business now all these changes that you've made if that's the favorite part of the job how often do you get to experience that you personally Oh, uh, not as much as I'd probably like, but my favorite part is being able to share that with other people so they can feel that feeling I get with other people. I'm, I'm going to actually, that plays into my bigger mission mm -hmm. of helping more people enjoy the outdoor space. I might not be able to get to experience that firsthand, but if I can teach other people how to kind get that for homeowners. Enjoy it vicariously. I, Yes, yeah. vicariously, but then I'm going to be able to help way more people with my mission of yeah. getting people outside, enjoying the outside, you know, enjoying their backyard. Yeah, I could totally relate to that. I mean, that's why we started this podcast and we started the whole hardscaper thing. Was, yeah. You know, how can we help more hardscapers 
enjoy the great things of this industry instead of grinding Absolutely. it out thinking it's a dead end dead end job it's not oh like the, yeah. the world is your oyster in this space it's insane and you're showing that like and, and just you know again it's the it's it's all those mindsets right it's that mindset of abundance it's that mindset that i can always grow and get better it's that mindset that people want to be challenged and people want to grow i'm not the only nut in my company that wants that you know <laughs> yeah. everyone else does too if i have the right players yeah. so let me paint the right huh? picture let's create the right environment and let's go we're gonna do it together and that no one Absolutely. wants to do everything by themselves. That, that's, that's boring. Yeah. That's not fun. When you can do it as a team, yeah. way more fun. Absolutely. I much prefer playing hockey on a team than playing golf by myself. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. They're completely different sports. Oh, 100%. I, I, yeah, exactly. You got anything you want to add, Matt? Because uh, I, I don't know. Like it's, You've said so much great stuff. I feel like. You know, we might as well, like we're closing in on time, but if you got any other nuggets you want to drop in, let's go. Um, shoot, I can't. Hard to just yeah, ask me another well, question. You, you, we <laughs> can keep this going if you want, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this then. Okay. Well, actually, I'm looking at the questions that, that, that I prepared here. Okay. You know what? I'm going to ask you this one. This will be the last question. All right. So uh, on one of your recent Instagram stories that I saw, uh, you were talking about how you mentor every day. And as the leader of your company, that's kind of what your role is. Break that down for us. What what does that actually mean? What does uh, the day-to-day -day look like for you if you've managed to get a general manager, you've managed to break down the different roles and you have the right captains in place yeah. that can drive that and they're empowered through the uh, awareness of core values. They're empowered through an understanding of the mission of the company, the vision of the direction and all these KPIs. So basically they have everything to make the right decisions now. Yeah. What does your day to day look like if you've set that up? So I've been on a mission to what I like to call manage by wandering around <laughs> and that just allows me to tap into who I am the most. I'm not a very organized person. I like to just kind of bounce around and just let ideas flow. And so I might just walk into like, I'll share a perfect example of, of how this went down today, right here at the office. I pop in across the hall to um, the, the sales office and I peek over Sherry, my designer's office. I'm like, Hey, what you working on? And so, you know, I'm looking at this and she's like, Ugh. And I could just see like 15 different drawings of the same backyard. And it's like this weird shaped pie with like a tag at the bottom. And it's, it, I could just tell it wasn't clicking. And she's like, mm. I don't know what to do with this backyard. And so okay. I said, all right, let's hear it. And she's, you know, so she's telling me all the things like, all right, well, they want this. They have this destination patio in their head and blah, 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 blah. But here's the rub. They got a tight budget. I'm like, all right, back up. Cause I know this client has been, you know, come back around three or four times. Like they've reached out to us, but then they disappeared. And then they reach back up to us. There's a deeper meeting. Why are they, why do they keep coming back to Heiner? And, and so I'm, I'm asking all these, like these, these prompting questions and peeling back the onion. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm asking her, why do they want to keep coming? Well, you know, so she has the example of the first design that they paid for and they didn't like it. And all, everything else that she was coming up with was just another version of that. I'm like, they're coming to us because we know how to take the backyards to the next level. And so, you know, I challenged her and I said, here, and we just started sketching out these different ideas. She's like, but that's going to blow the budget. And so I was able to break it down and just be like, all right, you're just gonna have to front load it. And it's all gonna be in the presentation on how you sell this design. I understand that you're trying to respect that budget, but that's not why they came to us. They came to be inspired. They came because they wanted to set goals with us and achieve them with us. Not only are our employees trying to do that, but our clients wanna achieve those goals with us. And so if we can give them that space that is what they're asking for, you can either fail them as a designer or you can fail them as, you know, fail them on the budget budgetary planet you know yeah, exactly so, you know like you're gonna have to pick one because you know both isn't working you've tried both it isn't out. working exactly but Bo both isn't working so they've already gotten one version and if they liked that good enough they would have accepted it and they would have hired that other company but they came back to us 
So we have to recognize that and we need to deliver what they came to us first. But if you can set the stage and just tell that client that, look, this is the starting point of the conversation. I don't want to fail you as a designer. Here's what you asked for. And if we need to scale back, don't make those decisions for them. Let them make those decisions yes. and let them take the things Absolutely. out that they don't want or that's not important to them. But don't, don't take that responsibility for them. That's their decision. And they ask for a certain amount of things and it's going to cost what it's going to cost. And, you know, at that point they paid for our time. They paid for the design. You know, I told her like, let's just upgrade them to 3d because now they're going to really buy into it. And now you might be able to spend their entire budget on a phase one rather than them just getting all of it in phase one. Now you got a long repeat customer. Now you got a client that's going to come back for phase two, possibly phase three. But at the end of the day, they're going to be happier because they're going to get what they want and they're going to be enjoy it that much more. But you're, you know, I use that as an opportunity to mentor and teach her this because I was just wandering around. I just popped in the office. I could see her struggling and now she's fired up. She yep. went back out to the property today to grab some uh, elevation measurements so we could work out the design details of what we were working up with. And she used that as an opportunity to speak to the client and kind of plant the seeds that, hey, I'm blowing the budget here. But and now, but I'm going to blow I'm your bringing, mind too. <laughs> I'm bringing the magic. I'm yeah. bringing the magic. And she said it worked. They lit up. They got excited. Now they can't wait to see the presentation when it's ready. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, you got to dig down. You got to find that, that yeah. bottom motive. Yeah. And that, Long, you know, uh, short answer long. That's uh, that, that's a, an example of how I was able to, uh, you know, m take an opportunity to mentor my yeah. team every day. That's so. an amazing example. You should be very proud of what you've set up so far. Like I, I am so impressed with this conversation. That this couldn't have gone any better. Like you're Thanks, a stud, Alex. man. Like that's that's awesome. You're for sure going to be back on the show. <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, this is, I love this stuff. I mean, I, I think I've got a podcast in my future just because I have a lot of fun doing this. So really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and, and meet you for the first time yeah. uh, via the, you know, the, the new digital world that we're in. But, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, no, thank you for having me today. Awesome. If people want to reach out to you, want to want to pick your brain on stuff, uh, I know you've been super transparent with everything I've asked here on the show and even in the DMs I sent you. Is the best way through uh, through Instagram? Uh, yeah, Instagram would be the best. Uh, at the underscore yardist is, is the best way to get to me directly. Okay, fantastic. Well, once again, thank you very much for joining us. This has been just a mountain of, of insight. Super happy with how this went. Uh, awesome. And uh, I guess that's it for this, uh, this show, folks. Uh, we'll see you next week on the Hardscape Growth Show. Till then... Work hard, pave harder, and stop being in a mindset of scarcity. The world is an abundant place. Let's go. Let's take it all. We can get whatever we want. And Matt's a perfect example of that. So thank you, and we'll see you next week.